Hi, uh, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for our machine learning and data analytics class. Um, this video um, is actually kind of the third one in our sequence here about Python programming. So I ended up kind of splitting this one up. So I, in the previous video, I, I just ended talking about kind of the higher level data structures and containers that are available in Python. So this video, hopefully a little bit shorter than the last one, um, is there, there's two topics I'm going to cover. Um, and so I should really probably rename this um, object-oriented programming in Python or, or classes and objects in Python. And I also want to talk maybe a little bit about functional programming in Python. We're going to be using both paradigms um, uh, for the examples um, and for the libraries that we use in our class, um, in, in this class, okay? So um, Python supports both programming in an object-oriented way and programming in a functional programming uh, sort of way, okay? So um, I encourage you, you know, if, if you don't, I, I'm, I'm hoping that most people, again, most people um, have done some programming, right, um, and, and know programming language before they came to this class. Uh, I'm hoping that you at least have heard about object-oriented programming, if not have also done a little bit of it, like created classes in a programming language, um, and uh, you know classes with with uh, um, attributes and and member methods and things like that. You can call so so many many languages support object-oriented programming, like C++ or Java. Um, so uh, I I. I'm betting that maybe not as many of you are familiar with functional programming, but functional programming is, is like, uh, it's, it's another way of organizing um, a program to solve a problem, okay? In many ways, functional programming and object-oriented programming are kind of opposites, all right? So anyway, let, let's get in here. So um, again, like I said, I'm, I'm assuming that probably more people are going to be uh, somewhat familiar with object-oriented programming. Uh, you might want to at least you know, if, if you're very unfamiliar with kind of the high-level principles of object-oriented programming, haven't heard about those before, um, you might want to go and, and find um, some resources. I mean, at least read this, if not find some others, um, um, and look at things like encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, uh, uh, polymorphism. I'll probably be throwing around these terms a little bit here, okay? Um, all right, so... Python supports creating classes and objects, so you can program, you can write programs in an object-oriented manner in Python. So one way of thinking about objects and object-oriented programming is it's a way to add your own user-defined data types to the core of the Python language. Okay, so to me, that's the way I I, I usually think of 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 creating objects in any language. It's 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 gives you the ability to add a user-defined type to become a new type that can be used uh, in the language. So, so our basic types, you know, are ints and floats um, and strings. Um, and you can really think of containers also as a kind of type, so lists and sets and dictionaries, okay? So, so object-oriented programming allows us to add some new ones of those, and we'll get an example of that, all right? So, um, so a classic example of creating a class is to have like um, mathematical classes to represent, th represent things like points and shapes and things. Okay, so I'll, I'll follow that kind of convention. Um, so we use the class keyword uh, to define um, a new class uh, in Python. And you have to give a name to your class. We're going to call this point. So th this is going to be something that we're going to use to represent a two-dimensional point in space, okay? So, so um, our points only are two-dimensional, so they just have a, an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, all right? So once you define a class, you can create an ins what's known as creating an instance of your class. So this is, this is like creating um, a string or a list. I, I'm creating an object, okay? Um, now, my object doesn't really have very much defined that it can do, but, but I, created, I just created an instance of my object. So I've got, actually got an object, okay? Now, since Python is a dynamic language, um, I can actually dynamically define member attributes um, and just add them into my class, okay? So, 
um, for example, I could say, so I didn't notice we're using the dot notation here. So we, we've run across this before in the previous video. So if I want to, I can just say, well, there's an attribute called X that's um, inside of the namespace of my my instance object P here, okay? So the, the attribute X has a value of 3, the attribute Y for P has a value of 4, and voila, I've done that. So these are what are known as class attributes or member attributes of the class X and Y, okay? So you can think of that as that's the X, X and Y location of my two-dimensional point, all right? So P is an instance of, of, of the point class, so you can create other instances. So just like I can create multiple strings or multiple lists or whatever, I can create like a second point, um, P2 equals point. Um, so um, yeah, so you don't have to do the parentheses, which might look a little bit strange. Well, m you know, maybe not. It depends on kind of what language or background you have, all right? So uh, either way, so, so creating a, a new instance of an op is kind of like calling a function, and we'll get to that in a second, okay? Um, so anyway, so, so P2 is just another point, and I give it a different set of values. So, so the point, so, so the, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that, you know, I still have my original point P, which is at X location 3, Y location 4, and I have my new point P2 is negative 5, negative 7, all right? Um, all right, so just kind of real quickly, I mean, like you can compose functions and like you can compose data structures, you know, like a list can contain or can have another list inside of it, um, you can certainly do composition of objects, and not only can you do it, but this is very useful and powerful. Um, so, for example, I could create a rectangle um, class, a new class called rectangle. So the definition of a rectangle, I mean, there's two basic ways that you would do a rectangle normally. Either I could start with um, a corner a, a corner of the rectangle and have the width um, and the height, which is what we're doing here, or I could define the lower left corner and the upper right corner. Th those would be two ways to define a rectangle. So we'll do the first one here. So our rectangles are going to have four attributes. Either way, you have four attributes. So, in the, But in this case, we have the, the lower left-hand corner, which is the X and Y point. So we assume that's the, the lower left-hand corner, and then a width and a height. But notice we're using ob object composition. So the corner here is itself a point, right? And we define, we, we, we assign it that the lower left corner is at X location 30, Y location 60, and then our rectangle has a width of 200 and a height of 100, all right? Um, okay. So we've created some pretty basic classes so far that don't do very much, so what can you do with them? Well, I mean, you have added a new kind of data type to the language, okay? so. Just like I can pass um, in lists or ints or floats or any kind of data type to a, a function, I can pass in um, instances of the new classes that we just defined. Okay? So if I wanted to, I could define a function distance that assumes that we're passing in two points that have attributes x, both of them have attributes x and y. So um, so this function, assuming that, that these are two instances of a point object, um, I can access the, um, the x attribute from point 1 and 2 and the y attribute from point 1 and 2, and I can use that to calculate the, the distance using the Euclidean distance uh, formula, right? So that will tell you, so, so if I pass in my point 1, my point, my point 2, It'll tell me the distance from 3, 4 to negative 5, 7 is that, uh, 13 point something, right? Or just another example, so I could calculate the upper right-hand corner. So our representation of a rectangle is the lower left-hand corner and the width and the height. But from that information... I could derive what the upper right-hand corner must be of the rectangle. It's just the x, the, the lower left-hand corner 
x location plus the width becomes the upper right hand x and the lower left hand corner y plus the height becomes my upper right corner, right? All right, so in both these cases, I mean, these are just regular Python functions with a def, but, you know, the first function is taking points and the second function is taking a rectangle as our parameter, right? So these functions wouldn't work if I passed in something it wasn't expecting. Right. So if, if, if I tried to access the, uh, you know, the X and the Y member variables and those weren't available for these objects I pass in, the, the function would crash when we, when we called it. Okay. Um, okay, so although we defined some classes and passed in some instances to some regular functions, the, the above code... Um, is, is not really object oriented yet, okay, or, or at least it's it's pretty you know um, um, useless, okay. So there's there's so much there's there's too much that we're doing by hand here. So the big thing is that the objects aren't encapsulating the operations. So we haven't defined the operations that we can do yet with our point object and our rectangle um, object instances, okay. Um, so both of those functions I did before, we can make those what are known as member functions of our class, okay? So for example, um, I can make distance um, a, a member function of the point class. So here's how you, how you add functions to classes. So, so here, notice I got my, I'm redefining my point class. But now def, notice that def is indented by 4. So because it's within the block of my class here, that means that this is a member function. This is a member of the point class, okay? It's within the point class's namespace is another way you can think about this, right? Another thing to make note, note of is that we pass in self as the first parameter here. So all member functions have at least one parameter, which is going to be called self by convention, okay? But the, the, the implementation um, is pretty much similar to the distance we did before, except um, I just renamed P1 as self, and I renamed the other point as just simply P. Okay, But I'm calculating the distance between self and some other point P. But both of these, in the context of this function, should be point objects, Okay, and, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. All right. So if, if P1 is a point who starts at the origin, so X and Y location is zero, and if P2 is also another point, so both of these were making instances of points, and its location is at 3, 4, so the distance, this, this, reform, this forms a 3, 4, 5 right triangle, so the distance from here to here should be 5, if you calculate the Euclidean distance. So if we say P1 dot, so notice, here, here's how you invoke a member function. So P1 is a point, um, and distance is a member function at point. So if I if I do p1 dot distance, I'm going to invoke my member function. But notice, even though I defined it with two parameters, I only pass in one. Okay, because whenever you invoke a member function on an instance of an object, that instance of the object is passed in implicitly as the first parameter. So it's like I'm calling a function distance on P1, P2, like, like a regular function, okay? But, um, but yeah, but, but the distance function is now a member function of, of P1, okay? So, so anyway, of, of the point class here, right? So, so anyway, I mean, P1 is going to be self inside of this function. That, that's, that's who we call, whose member function we call, was P1's distance member on. And P2 is going to be another point. So inside of here, you know, self.x is going to be 0, and self.y is going to be 0, and, and then p's, p.x is going to be 0.2. So p.x is going to be 3, and, and p.y is going to be 4, right? So we should get our um, distance um, attribute. If I, re if I run that cell there. And, and, and we should get our, our distance between 0.1 and 0.2, which is 5, right? Um, all right, another quick example. So we could also um, turn that upper right corner function into a member function for our rectangle class. Uh, 
Um, so in this case, um, we don't have any other parameter except for the rectangle itself, right? But all we need to do is calculate the upper right-hand corners x and y position. Although notice here, I'm again, I'm reusing, I'm composing my object, so I'm using point. So I create a new point, um, and I set the x and y values of my new point, uh, and I return that as the result when I call rectangles upper right corner. So if we create a rectangle of this width and height um, and having this corner, we call the upper right corner, uh, we get a result um, is a new point um, with the x and the y value. So if I run both of these cells, that is, there you go. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, a few more things about member functions for classes. So there are um, a bunch of um, special member functions, and I thought I had a link to this. I'll check. Um, hopefully, hopefully I got it here a little bit lower somewhere. So, so there, there are a bunch of member special member functions that you can define for classes. Um, So, I mean, you know, these classes are somewhat useful, but, but there's still a lot of stuff missing, okay? So the, the first kind of special function I wanted to introduce was the init function. So in other languages, the init um, um, goes by the name of the constructor, okay? This is, this is how you construct instances of a class by defining an init method, all right? So let's just look, look at an example of it. So if, if I wanted to have a constructor or an init method for my point class, so the, the, the normal thing you do with an init method is, like, those attributes of the class, you normally want to construct your classes to, to, to have initial values for the important attributes of your class, or default values for those, right? So in this case, case my point class, we construct it with an initial x and y location, although... Uh, we, we set these with default values, so if you don't specify these for our point, it'll default to being that the point is at the origin, so x0 and y0, right? Um, likewise with rectangle, I can do the same thing, but I need both the, the lower left-hand corner points, x and y uh, location, and I need the width and the height. right? And I have defaults for all those, so if you don't specify any of those, you end up with a, a, a rectangle, that's lower left-hand corners at the origin and as a unit width and a unit height, all right? So how do you use those? Well, the, the init method or constructors are called when you create a new instance of your object, okay? So again, if I don't provide an X and Y location for a point, um, it'll default to the origin, okay? So so now if we look at the, the, the point, P1 is going to look is going to be located at the origin, but point two, um, I gave a location of x of three and a y of four, right? So now, I compare this to the previous example. So I have this, the points at the same two locations, but I'm able to create them much more cleanly using the constructor, and then I can call the distance method again, right? Same with the rectangle. So I can create a rectangle um, whose lower left-hand corner is at the origin that's of unit width and height, if I ask for the upper right-hand corner, it's going to be at 1, 1. And I can create a rectangle where I give the, the, the lower left-hand corner and the width and the height. Um, and we can get the upper right-hand corner like that, all right? So the init is an example of a special method. There's lots of special methods. There. There's what I was looking for. So a fuller list of the, the, the special methods are here. Um, we're only going to touch on a few of these, but we might see others of these in, in our course um, uh, for various uh, reasons, right? Um, so, I think I just had uh, some examples here. So, the string is pretty useful. So if we want to have something so that we can, um, if anything needs to find a string representation of our class, you can overload the string method, or I should say override the string method. 
um, add overloads. This is an example of, of what might be called operator overloading in other languages. So if you implement an add method, you'll be overloading the plus operator for instant for your classes. So what this uh, I defined add to do um, a, a vector addition here. Um, and I define multiply for my rectangle to do um, a scaling operation. So, so to multiply the width and the height by some scaling factor. All right. So here, notice so if we have point 0.1, um, if we print point 0.1, it's going to end up calling the string method. So anytime you send a point or, or send an, an object to something that wants a string for output, It'll see if that object can convert itself into a string representation. If it can, you know, like using the string method, then it will call that method and use that. So, so when we call uh, print on P1, you get this output. Right? And when you call print on P2, you get this output. Um, and when we call add, so here we're, we're, we're showing the, the overloading of the add operator. So if you do P2, P2 plus P3, that's going to call add, um, like, as, you know, again, if you know operator overloading, that's doing something like p2 dot underscore underscore add p3, okay? So, so the right-hand side of the operator becomes the parameter that's passed into the function, um, and then the left-hand side of the operator is, is the instance of the object that we call the um, class method on, right? Um, and yeah, here, here's rectangle. So rectangle, we do the scaling. So again, we overloaded the, the, the times to, to scale. So we, we, we um, scale it by five here. Um, so um, I've got a syntax error somewhere in my code up above there. I don't know. I almost changed something here. Did something. So um, anyway, um, okay. So uh, one final thing. I'm going to make kind of a, a slightly different example for this. Uh, I just wanted to mention inheritance. So. Um, um, because we will probably use inheritance a little bit. So this is another one of the, the, the basic principles of object-oriented programming. So like composition, we, we had some examples of composition. So our rectangle uses the point function, so, so, so it's using composition. Um, so inheritance is another thing um, that, that's a, a basic principle that you use when you're de designing object-oriented um, applications, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I recommend to, to read through the, the section in the Think Python textbook on inheritance. They have a good example in there of creating a deck of cards that I really like. I have a slightly smaller, uh, quicker example. So a very common kind of thing um, when learning about inheritance is to do something like to create a, a, a shape inheritance hierarchy, okay? So... Let's say we want to do that. Um, we want to create a basic base class for our hierarchy, um, and we're going to derive more complex classes from our base polygon class. Okay, so a polygon class is a basic class that defines um, what all classes that are going to be that are going to inherit from polygon can do. Okay, so in this case, we we define a constructor for polygons. So our polygons are actually a little bit simpler than uh, the rectangle. So we don't have a particular location that they're at. We just keep track of the number of sides and the length of each side of the polygon. So we can do some different things with our polygons here. So, um, so we, I've I got some, example, some, some examples in this of what are basically what are known as like virtual functions or pure virtual functions in other languages like C++. So um, we have some functions that um, um, are expected to be overridden by our base classes. 
like the polygon name, but 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 classes that that are children of polygon should override this to give more specific uh, or better names for the polygon name. Likewise, we, we define an area, but um, we don't define really an implementation for area. All we do is raise an exception if, if this area for the base class ends up being called. So we're expecting that, that child classes need to override this, provide their actual implementation of the area so that, so that you can calculate the area of different polygons like triangles and quadrilaterals and things. So. Um, now, and we define a string representation, although notice that, that we're using polymorphism kind of here. So um, basically we call the polygon name to get the name and we construct a string to represent our polygon. So if, if, a, if a child class overrides this, they can end up inserting a different name even though they don't override the base class's string implementation here. All right. So if you just look at the base class, I mean, it's, it's a class like we had before so far, okay? So we, we've got one of these special methods for our constructor. So the constructor is, is expecting a, 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 tup, a, a tuple, uh, which just has a list of the sides and the length of each side, okay? So it, it takes that as the length to be the number of sides. So here we constructed actually a triangle, a 3, 4, 5 right triangle that had three sides of length 3, 4, and 5, right? And then if we try and print this out, this ends up calling our string method. So we, we get this string, um, which is returned, and we get that displayed when we call print on triangle. Right. And this, this description, this polygon name, comes from because we, we, we do a percent %d sided polygon where we, we replace percent D with the, the number side. So in this case, we have three sides, so we end up describing this as a three-sided polygon, or i.e. a triangle, all right? Okay, so let, let's, let's show an actual inheritance, right? So we might have a triangle um, that derives from polygon. So this is how you, call, how you define inheritance. Um, um, so triangle is our child class. It's going to inherit from polygon base class. So what inheritance means in object-oriented programming is, is triangle is a type of polygon. So everything we define for polygon is a member method of triangle. Okay, so, so all of that stuff is inherited. Okay, so we've already got an init method and, and a polygon name method and an area and a string method for, for triangle by inheriting from polygon. Now we can override some of those methods. So we actually we, we, we kind of we override the init method. We don't completely override it because we we override it um, just to first of all check to make certain that we actually have exactly three sides. If somebody tries to create a triangle type polygon, and if 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 you pass in a tuple that's not three sided, we throw an exception. Okay, well, we'll we raise an exception, but. If it is, if it's actually a triangle, then it's safe. And, and we this is an example of chaining um, method. So we end up calling our base classes a knit method um, for um, to initialize our sides and the number of sides here. All right. But polygon name we're completely overriding. So we don't we don't call our base class. We, we just override. So if if polygon name gets called on a triangle class, which is a type of polygon, um, it's going to end up with a name of triangle instead of three-sided polygon, right? Likewise, we override the area, okay? So, so this is an example, kind of an example of a virtual function, as it's called in C++, okay? So we, we really need to uh, provide an implementation for this, so if somebody tries to actually ask for the area. If we didn't provide this, they would just get an exception because they would end up calling the base classes area, right? Um, but here um, we're using um, a well-known function to calculate the area of a triangle just given the length of the side. So for, for a triangle, there's only one unique, so given three sides and the length of those three sides, there's only one possible triangle, so there's only one possible area. So we can we can just directly calculate use the formula for that to calculate the area, right? Um,
and, and we didn't override the string method, but there is a string method, but um, if we call string, or if we try to print out one of our triangles, it'll end up calling the base cast a string, um, which will call this code to, to, to print out a, a string representation of our triangle, right? So, um, so yeah, first of all, let's try the constructor, right? So if we try and construct a two-sided polygon, which is um, a, an illogical shape, but we can try it, um, um, but, but yeah, we'll get our exception thrown. Or if we try more than, if we try more than three, also we get the same kind of um, um, exception. Or we should. Oops, oh, there we go. Um, right, so we get the same kind of exception. That the, the triangle must have three sides, right? But if we construct it correctly, so here we're, we're showing an example of calling, here we're going to call the print, so this will end up calling the base class a string method, but we're also going to call the area method, so we'll try out our area method that we overrode, that we defined for our triangle classes. So for a 3, 4, 5 right triangle, again, it's, it's, it should be half of 3 times 4, because um, the, the 3 and the 4 are the sides of the, of the right of the right angle of a rectangle, um, but it's only half of that since it's a triangle. So it's one half of three times four is, is the area of that. So, so yeah. So in fact, we do get six for the area, right? Um, and we create like an equilateral triangle. So in this case, all the angles are going to be sixty degrees. So I mean, you can use a different formula to find to figure out that area, or you can use just the length of the sides, which which from this can you can derive the area. Then. That should be correct for the area for our triangle. So, um, all right, and then finally, so let, let's derive one more child class. So that was a triangle, which is a type of polygon. Polygon. So we'll derive we'll derive a quadrilateral, which is a polygon with four sides here, right? Um, and as I thought about this, uh, I'll leave this as an exercise for students if you're interested, but. Um, uh, a logical thing to do after this would be to actually derive um, a, a square class, which is a type of quadrilateral, and a rectangle class, which is a type of quadrilateral, with both of those with specific constraints. I kind of started that because I've got some some code in here that does some special things to, to detect if you're trying to create a square or a rectangle. Okay. Um, um, so, in this case, uh, you know, we ended up, I kind of ended up with my classes that I wanted to be able to calculate the areas of these polygons. So, to calculate the area of a quadrilateral, you really need to know the, the um, at least two of the angles. And actually, you need to know two of the opposing angles. And so, it doesn't help to know two adjacent angles. Because, you know, think of a square... You know, is going to have an area, but if you start squashing the square so you get like a diamond or something like that, the area changes even though the, the length of the sides don't change. So you can get different areas depending on the angles, right? Um, anyway, so this is an example. So, so we can create our own constructor for, the quad, for our quadrilateral where we still want the sides, but we need two additional parameters. Okay, so in order to calculate the area, we need we need the two opposite angles of our quadrilateral. Okay, so we're going to define that as required for our. So notice we're not given default values for any of these. So you have to give the four sides, and if you don't give four sides inside of this tuple, um, then an exception is thrown. But you also have to provide two more angles, the opposite angles for the quadrilateral. Um, and again, we, we chain our base class to initialize the number of sides and, and our sides attribute, but then we, we um, keep track in this constructor of our two angles that we're given, right? Um, now... Um, I don't have to really describe area. So area is pretty similar to what we did with triangle, except for um, I use a different formula that can be used 
to calculate the area given the four sides. Although we again we need in order to calculate this area we need the four sides plus the um, the two angles. But yeah, if you have all that information, you can kind of do a similar thing that we did before to calculate the area. Okay. But here for polygon name, um, we're doing some things. Um, so uh, again, we we could we could maybe pull this code out into some subclasses of the quadrilateral. So we have a square and a rectangle subclass, right? Uh, but we're, we're not doing that yet. Um, so basically, all we're doing is we're trying to detect if it's a square. So if it is a square, we, we set our name to be square when we display ourselves in the print in the string function, right? And if it's a rectangle, we display a rectangle. If it's neither of those, then it's just a, a general quadrilateral, right? Um, so how can we detect if it's a square or rectangle? So, so we, we added some additional methods to our quadrilateral. So we can detect if it's a square, um, if all the sides are equal, so A is B A equals C and A equals D, so that means all four sides are equal, and if all angles are 90 degrees, okay? So all angles are not, actually if the two opposite angles are 90 degrees, that means that all four angles have to be 90 degrees. So if, if angle 1 is 90 and angle 2 is 90, then all angles are 90. Okay? So from those two pieces of information that all four sides are equal and um, all angles are 90 degrees, if both of those are true, uh, then it's a square. Right? Otherwise it's not. Although, I mean, it could still be a rectangle. It could be the, the, the case that all angles are 90, but uh, if, it's, if, if it's not a square, that means that, that two, one of the sides is longer than, than the other opposite side. So it's a rectangle in that case, right? Um, all right, so that, that's, you know, that's probably enough. And so, so, you know, if, if you create a quadrilateral uh, with all equal sides and all... Um, and both in the two opposite angles are 90 degrees, um, it will detect it's a square if you print it out, um, and you'll get the expected 25, um, because it's, it's 5 times 5 square, or 25 for the area. You know? So that just kind of shows that this area function is, is working, even though it's doing it in a more complex way than just realizing this is a square and multiplying one, you know, squaring the, 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 the length of the side. Likewise for a rectangle, so again this is a rectangle because the all of the angles are 90 degrees, but one side is one side is longer than the other, so in this case the area must be 15, um, which which we get, right? Um, and a general more complex quadrilateral, um, but uh, in this case, if you look at that formula, you should get about 100, and that's what we get for the area. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of the basics of object-oriented programming. So, um, you you probably, I mean, at least you need to understand kind of what's going on because we will have to do some things where we like make our own classes, which are subclasses of some classes from libraries or some things like that. So. So, so, so you should understand at least the basics of, of object-oriented programming and, and how you create classes and, and do inheritance in Python, all right? Um, so, as I mentioned, um, and I won't take as long on this one, but um, um, another kind of style of programming is functional programming, all right? So, um, So, in some ways, um, functional programming is kind of like the opposite of object-oriented programming. Um, so, functional programming uses what are known as pure functions with no side effects. So, functional programming is kind of like the, the mathematical idea of a function. So, you want to have function. Pure, a pure function means that it just takes input, like the parameters, and then it transforms those inputs and returns it as output. But there's no side effects. Um, um, you know, so it doesn't change any state, and it doesn't, may, it doesn't have any side effects as a result of calling the function. Okay? That's kind of what a pure function is. Okay? Whereas objects, um, they're all about keeping an internal state. And then whenever you call a member 
function for a, an object, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to um, do a, a, a sequence of the changes of state of the object um, in order to model something, basically, in order to solve your problem. Okay, so, so objects are all about kind of side effects. They're about maintaining state and, and modifying states through some kind of a state transition um, that represents the, the, the state of an object. All right. Um, okay. So first of all, let me revisit a couple of things about object general programming. Like I said, I don't want to spend so much time on here. You, you can, um, um, you know, uh, look at this link. Um, I encourage you to at least read the basics of this functional programming style with Python. But I mentioned this, I think, in the previous notebook, although I probably didn't mention it in my video. But um, one aspect of functional programming is that functions need to be first-class objects in the language. That basically means, in a practical sense, is that we need to be able to create a function and pass it in as a parameter to another function, okay? So as a quick example, um, let's build our own what are known as a filter function. This is a common kind of thing for functional programming. So uh, what a filter function does is it just takes another function as, an, as its first parameter, which performs a test. And then it takes, a, a, you can think of this as a, a sequence or a list of items as a second parameter. And basically it returns a new list um, where every item that passes the test in the original list is returned in the new list. And any item that, that doesn't pass the test is filtered out, is not returned, okay? So uh, this example should make it clear. So if I just have a function that returns true, if a value is even, so so here the, the 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 function that we pass into our filter is expecting that you take that you can give it a parameter and it returns a boolean result, true or false. All right. Um, and so then our implementation of our filter basically we we just look through every item in this sequence, and if the item passes the test, we append it to this result. Then we just return that result. So the result is, is that filter, kind of like its name suggests, is we can filter out um, all things that are not even by, by doing calling all filter with the is even test on the list. Okay. So the result of that is that uh, you know if we have this list and we filter by is even, we only get the even values. Two, six, four, eight, two. But you know our filter is a is a general method, so it basically it's it's functional programming because it doesn't maintain any state. It just takes the inputs of a function and a list, and it returns a new list. Okay, so so it's it's a mathematical function. So a pure function, I think about them they, they're they're functions in the mathematical sense. It takes inputs and it transforms it to outputs into an output or outputs. All right. So I could give it a different filter function, um, is odd or two. So now if, if I call it for the same list, uh, I'll only get the odd numbers or the two. So three, five, two, nine, seven, two, right? Oops. Um, Accidentally pasted something there, sorry. So, um, there we go. So, 352972. Um, okay, so the final thing that I want to say about this um, so, the main reason, the main example that we're going to be using of functional programming is that the scikit-learn library that we're going to use a lot, it's really organized as a functional programming uh, along functional programming principles, okay? One of the, one of the, the best examples of that is that um, it, you can create what are known as pipe, pipelines or, or, or 
data transformation pipelines, okay? So um, it has a transform object, and in a later lecture, I'll go into more detail of this. But, but the basics of a, of a transform, it's an object, but it's, it's really a function because a, a transform object has a, has a single function um, that it implements where it takes um, a data, it takes a table of data as input. Um, so that's the only input for the function. And then it transforms and returns a new table of input. Okay, it's kind of like um, a filter or a map here. And that's really what, the, and, but, but the idea though is so it's a new table of output, but then I could, I could feed that into another transformer, okay? So the way that you build what are known as data um, uh, analytic, uh, so data cleaning pipelines or data cleaning transformations, is you just have a sequence of, of, of these transformers. And you start the first one and you just pass them through the, this transformer or this pipeline, okay? And, and, you know, and that's a very common pattern in functional programming. Um, so we can give some examples of that. So um, there's a built-in function called filter that does exactly like what our filter did before. So it's the same thing, although it's a little bit more um, general, a little bit more sophisticated. So what filter does is it expects a function like, like we had before. So that's the same, but it expects uh, what's known as a, um, uh, a, an iterator as input and it returns an iterator as output. Okay, so if you were to call filter on this, you wouldn't exact, you wouldn't get a list back like you might be expecting. So what's being returned is an iterator object. So you would need to iterate over that object to get the things out. So again, if, if I want to ask for the even numbers for all, if, if I look over all the numbers from zero to a hundred, right? Um, if I iterate over the, the, this thing that's returned from calling filter, uh, you'll get what you're expecting in that case, so 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, right? Or another way you can do that is if you pass that to the list function, that will iterate over the object for you and return the items as a list, okay? So if I do that, I'll get actually th this list of the items from 0 up to on all, all the even ones. Um, all right. So map is another example of, of a functional programming kind of thing. So basically what map does um, is it applies this function to every value of the iterator. So, so the, um, the filter applies the test to every value and it only allows the things to, to be returned that pass the test. So what a map does is it applies this function to every value, and, and so you get a new value when you apply the function. So, so the, the, the re return result is going to be the same size as the input that you give, but, but every value is going to be transformed. It's going to be mapped from, a new re from the original result to the new result, as, a, as an example of a map, okay? Um, so I don't know if I have some good examples here, but uh, for example, here's an example of a generator um, or, or an, uh, an iterator. So this is basically just a generator that generates random 25 random numbers that have values between negative 10 and 10. So if I map this generator um, using the absolute value, it'll just take the absolute value of all the values. So everything will be positive instead of having some negative and some positive values, right? These are random integers from negative 10 to 10, okay? So you end up with only positive integers from 0 to 10, basically, when you do that, right? Um, or here's another example. So here's an example of using lambda functions, which I haven't talked about, but this is just like a um, <coughs> like a temporary function here. So here I'm going to return true um, if, if x is less than zero or false if it's greater than zero. So, so my mapping here maps all values less than zero to be true and all values greater than zero to be false. Right? So you end up with, with an array of, or a list of 25 values. The ones that were true were originally negative or zero and the ones that were false are, were originally positive. Um, 
so map can work on um, uh, can map uh, more than than two things together. Okay, so if you pass it a function that expects two parameters, so power expects two things as input, a base and a power. Okay, so if I map um, the power function, if I map all the bases to the powers, it's going to return a list where we take 10 to the 1 power, 20 to the 2 power, 30 to the 3 power, and so on. Right? So the result is 10, uh, 20 squared, 30 cubed, um, and so on. Right? Um, so enumerate, we already saw, enumerate is an example of like a mapping function. So basically, it, it means a built-in function, but it's basically um, mapping, um, uh, creating a sequence of, of tuples um, where we map, we create a tuple with the index and the item in a sequence, all right? So here, again, if I have random numbers from random integers, from 25 random integers, and I use enumerate, um, Enumerate basically does a map that returns a tuple of an index in that random integer. All right, so you can get to say, so basically what enumerate this, this is an implementation of enumerate right here. So given um, It's a map of two things. So, so given uh, um, a, a sequence of the indexes from zero to twenty-five, and given the random the, the twenty-five random numbers, so those are the two things. It, it returns the the tuple x y, right? So, so that gives you the same thing as as the enumerate function, right? Um, all right, and then there's many other things. Okay, so. So functional programming, I mean, it, it's really worth your while to, to understand, to be able to, to, to do things both using object-oriented methods and functional programming methods, okay? Python supports both, and you can even mix them within the same program, which can be good or bad, right? So, um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say any more about those things. I mean, there, there's lots more that you can learn about, although I think for this class, if you understand all those, what we had just in the, the basics in this, this notebook, um, you should be good for, for being able to use the libraries uh, like scikit-learn and some other stuff that we need in this class. So, um, Okay, so that's it for this um, um, lecture notebook. Um, so I hope that that was useful, um, and I hope it gave you enough stuff so that you can go and, um, you know, uh, look at more details of some of these things on your own um, that you need more information about. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I will see you then in the next video.